Hey guys, my name is Madeline Waleski and I'm a senior here at Notre Dame and today I'd like to introduce the first speaker of our Once a Titan series, Patricia Locke Dawson. Thank you, Maddie, and hello everybody. I'm Patricia Locke Dawson. I was Patricia Locke when I went here, or as those who know me, Patty. I went by Patty in high school. So whenever I run into somebody at the store and they say Patty, I know I went to high school with them. So um, things have certainly changed since I went here. This was not like this. This is incredibly beautiful. It was all black top. Um, I also, I was just commenting, I, I don't know if the D building is still the place where you go when you don't want to be seen doing things, but that's where we used to go <laughs> when we didn't want to be seen doing things. So I won't go into details, but the field is beautiful. It's just all very different. Um, I'm wondering though, is, is home ec still a thing? Because that's where we took home ec uh, back down there in the uh, uh, farthest room in D building. And in some ways, this campus looks so familiar to me. And in some ways, it looks so different. And it's so different in a really positive way, I think. It looks beautiful. I think it's a place where uh, people can come and there's history here. I know, you know, you run into people all the time who we had big families at Notre Dame that went here. So you run into people all the time that their kids are either here now, they're teaching here now, <laughs> or, uh, you know, you, you, you know somebody. And so that's kind of the beauty of the school here. There's really a rich tradition. And people don't ever forget they go to Notre Dame because it's a wonderful family. It's a wonderful family here. There's the gym. Snack bar used to be over there. I know. This building is all new. I don't know what that building is. But it looks like it's the faculty room. That wasn't there before. And the structures are nice for the lunches. I think we got that when I first came here. So it looks all very different. And we're entering the library now, but now I think it's got a totally different name. Right? It's a, is it the Learning Resource Center? Something like that? So. So I'm going to sit here now and we're going to answer some questions. My favorite part is talking to students. I love that. Since we're far away, I think I can do this since we're socially distanced. So you can hear me a little better probably. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Hi. and my faith in general have provided me with things I think that benefit anybody from for anything they want to do in life. I mean the biggest things that come to mind for me are self-discipline. I think that's something you learn even if you aren't very self-disciplined when you go here, <laughs> which I wasn't necessarily, but you take that with you. Self-discipline, um, character and integrity, that is something that was really instilled in me while I was here. Um, that whole idea that uh, it doesn't matter uh, who sees you, you, sh you should be doing the right thing, regardless of whether somebody knows it or not. Um, and also, uh, compassion and caring for others. And that translates into service above yourself, right? And I think uh, as Catholics and going to Catholic school, you learn that from a very early age. And it's really important in the political arena. And I will tell you that that actually, you didn't ask me this, but that's actually a challenge for politicians. Um, because one of our traditions, I think, here at Notre Dame and in our faith in general is, you know, you don't talk about, you don't talk about 
yourself. You don't talk about being um, how successful you are or, you know, humility is a big part of our tradition. And it's almost the opposite in politics. You have to talk about yourself all the time. You have to tell everybody how fabulous you are. That's a really uncomfortable place to be um, if you've been brought up to be the exact opposite. And in fact, I think um, Catholic faith teaches us not to uh, proselytize so much with our words, but with our actions. And that's how I've always operated my whole life. And in fact, one of my favorite quotes is attributed to Henry Ford, and it's, um, sorry, Henry Truman, Harry Truman, and it's, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. And I would, that's, I think that sums up my uh, time here at Notre Dame. Thank you. Uh, moving on to more topical questions, uh, I have a question about um, the homeless population. So, with an increase in homeless population, can we anticipate any solutions that might assist in helping these individuals find shelter? So, homelessness is a huge issue, right? I mean, it was from, um, it's up 30% this year from when it was last year, which was up 30% from the year before that. So you're right, it's increasing in our city. Um, and it's also a complicated thing. I think people sometimes come at it from two different directions. They think, oh, we just need to give more housing and that's gonna take care of the problem, right? We need, just need to get these folks into shelter, which is part of the problem. So we need to do that, we need to address that. Or they come at it from this idea that we just need to throw them all in jail, like it's a criminal thing to be homeless, which it isn't. And now for a certain number of people who are, um, you know, doing bad deeds and up to no good, and yes, of course, we need to enforce the laws against them, right? But it all lies somewhere in the middle. Of the 587 people that were counted homeless in this year's point-in-time count, um, Close to 20% said they became homeless for the first time this last year. We have 14% um, have struggled with addiction. Um, between 11 and 12%, I believe, are struggling with um, physical disabilities and others have uh, mental health issues. So that tells me that's a complicated issue that just providing houses or throwing somebody in jail is not gonna solve. So as mayor, it would be my job to uh, make sure that we have, one, a regional plan in place, which I have, right? I've got a three-point plan that gets at all of our resources at the federal, state, and regional level, and actions at each of those levels that we can take. So the first day I'm mayor, I will roll that plan out and make sure we have the resources to fund it and uh, so we can address the issue head on. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has created many challenges for people in their everyday lives. So what do you think the city of Riverside could do a better job of to make sure that everyone is healthy, safe, and starting to do normal things this flu season? That's it, right? Well, everybody get their flu shots, because I already did that. I think that's going to be a big, that's going to be a big uh, help in discerning who's, uh, I was just going to say, um, visiting our emergency rooms, let's put it that way. So we want to make sure we keep those clear for those folks that need it the most. Um, but in terms of what the city can do, we are often at the mercy of what the county tells us or what the state tells us, right? In terms, that's just kind of how the laws and the policies and the authorities work out. Uh, but the city can do things to help folks. And one of that is to make sure that we have uh, a repurposing of our spaces that may be closed down from some of the COVID activities. And one good example of that is our uh, restaurants, right? Many of our restaurants have been closed to in-person dining. And the city expedited a permit to allow restaurants to have outdoor seating now. So if you've been downtown lately in the past um, few weeks, you'll see that there are restaurants all up and down the downtown mall now with seating outdoors. That's creative and it's repurposing and it's coming up with a solution to help us get through a time um, uh, 
making do with, with what's been given to us, right? So I think those are the kinds of things the city can do more of, is helping businesses thrive in an environment that has more restrictions put on them and being creative about how to work within those constraints. I think the biggest thing though the city can do and a mayor and any of our elected officials can do is to make sure they are following the science, listening to our public health experts, um, making sure we're making decisions based on that and instilling um, trust in our population that we're making decisions based on that and that we have the best um, best in our uh, minds for our population. And then on top of that, just making sure everybody knows that um, the future is bright and that we're hopeful, that it doesn't have to go on like this. This too shall pass, right? And I think we need to let people know that because people become mired in the everyday struggles. We need to make sure that folks know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, so I have a question on balancing off the last question. So what do you believe is the most important for rebalancing the city budget during this time? Is it best to fund new infrastructure to create more jobs or allocate those same funds to local businesses and folks that hire more employees? Well, if only the city budget were that simple, right? I mean, the city budget is complicated in that it not only funds services and personnel, but it also goes towards prog uh, programs, just like what you were saying. Um, you're right, the city budget is in trouble. Um, I don't know if any of you know about that, but our city is looking at bankruptcy in a couple of years if we don't get our financial act together. Uh, one of the reasons that is so is because we have um, a huge debt. We're, we're facing a huge debt burden. So one of the things, I think one of the first things, and I also have a 10-point economic recovery plan that I would put into action my first day in office as well. But one of the biggest things we can do initially is restructure the debt we have, refinance it, like you would remortgage your house, um, do a different uh, financing. If we restructure that debt, it won't cost us so much to pay off what we've borrowed already. We can reduce our yearly debt service payments. And the city has done that to some extent, but I think we can go even farther with that. Um, also, what I think we need to do, and nobody wants to hear this, but we're gonna have to look at making some cuts to programs and employees and maybe not employees. We'll have to see, right? We have to have um, everybody at the table that's going to be impacted th by this. Not only employees, but city um, uh, citizens and business owners and community members so they can come to the table like we did when I was at the school board. We had a budget stabilization committee that helped us identify what our budgeting priorities should be, where our money should be going, and if there were areas that we could reduce or cut where those could be and give us a schedule for bringing that on back online at some point. That's going to be very important. And thirdly, we're really going to have to look at new ways of generating revenue within the city. We have to be able to let businesses know that we are open for business and come to Riverside. It's a great place to set up your business. And we can help by um, connecting small business owners with capital, um, startup capital, uh, micro loans. Um, we can get, uh, uh, we can accelerate or um, make a permitting a little bit easier for some of our businesses. So we can sort of essentially get out of their way and give them what they need to thrive. And so that's what we're gonna need to do. So this is going back uh, to the first question. Um, what is something that has driven your ambitions? Something that has driven my ambitions. Gosh, let's see. Honestly, the the biggest driver has been that I've wanted to make my city a better place to live. I've wanted to make my community, I've wanted to make my world a better place to live. That's why I went into environmental sciences. Um, I went into biology as an undergraduate and then I got my master's degree in forestry and I've worked in that space now for um, 25 years. Uh, I'm the youngest of five children here in Riverside and 
all my brothers and sisters left. They all went to Notre Dame, by the way. I don't know if you know that. I'm the youngest, all, all five of my, and my oldest brother went here when it was all boys. So uh, it changed the year he left. But um, when, I, when I was here, you know, my brothers and sisters were here and they went on. They left Riverside. They went off to go to school elsewhere, started their, you know, um, practices. I have brothers, a doctor, sisters, an attorney. They left Riverside because they didn't have those opportunities here. And so when I came back to Riverside after graduate school, I thought, I want to stay in Riverside. I want to be here, but I want my kids to feel they have opportunities. I want you to feel like you have opportunities. We don't want you to go, right? We want, we want our best and brightest to stay here with us. So um, I got busy and I got involved and I joined the planning commission so I was on the planning commission for five years, um, where I put my land use and environmental um, planning to to, be, um, to use there. Um, I was on the California Board of Behavioral Sciences for eight years. I was under Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Brown, both in both of their administrations, and um, they oversaw the mental health professionals because I feel mental health is a huge. Part of our calculus as a society and the health of our society. And then I was on the school board for the past eight years um, because I know education, that, like the education I got here at Notre Dame, is the foundation of any thriving, flourishing community. So all those things have honestly all been pointed and directed toward just making the world a better place and making our community a place where everybody has opportunities. What downward trend in Riverside within the last five years are you most proud of? Uh, what trend is the most worrisome? So what trends, let me, let me understand the question. What trends in Riverside am I most proud of or do I like the most and what don't I like about it? Oh, okay. um, <laughs> what downward trend? So what decrease or um, just slowing down of in terms of um, Perhaps crime, for an example. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, crime has gone down, I will say, which is good. But I was also going to say the trend towards um, economic development in our downtown area has gone up, which I really like. And um, one of the trends, I think, within our school district um, that I'm proud of, I know, has been our um, uh, closing our opportunity gaps between our students of color and other students. Um, that's, been, that's been a real issue for us, right? Everybody deserves to have access to the same education and the same opportunities. So um, our graduation rate went from 81% to 97%. That's an upward trend, that's not a downward trend. Um, um, and our uh, uh, college readiness for our African American students and our Latino students went up a huge amount, um, over 160% in the case of African Americans and 100% um, for uh, uh, our Latinx population. Um, but I think one of the things I'm probably most dismayed about, which I think we've already kind of touched on, is just the increase in homelessness. And when you have that increase in homelessness, there's a sense of hopelessness that comes with that, with people that feel that elected officials aren't doing their job, uh, community's not doing its job to take care of their most vulnerable, those who are homeless are not seeking the services they want. So that loss of hope, to me, is probably the most concerning thing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, with the ongoing race conversation going on in the United States, um, what is your plan to unite our community in this city of Riverside? That's a really important question right now, right? And I do believe Riverside is really much farther ahead than many communities in those debates and those questions. We have long been um, a community that values inclusion and values diversity. That's not to say we don't have a lot of work ahead of us, because we do. But I believe a lot of the practices that we have in place here in Riverside are model practices, right? Um, we do have a statement of inclusivity that the mayor's office has put out. Um, we have a human relations commission here. We have um, um, our police, uh, citizen police review commission. We were one of the first in the country to have that, which oversees um, uh, police activities and makes sure that they're being held accountable for things. Our police are very well trained. Um, 
you know, they wear body cameras, they have, um, they have their use of force is, their, is a lot lower than other communities. So our police are doing a very good job too. But I think as, as mayor, you know, coming into a situation, one of the biggest things you can do is just, you know, while I can't bring diversity to the seat in, in some aspects, I can surround myself with people that have different perspectives and see the world and see problems and have experienced trauma through their eyes uh, based on their experiences. And that's the best thing a leader can do is know when they don't know or what, what they can't know and to make sure they seek that out. So I think any leader who gets in there has to be able to uh, make sure that they are surrounded by people with differing perspectives, differing experiences, so that they can inform the decision making going forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so, in your opinion, what is more important? Acting in response to the will of the people, or acting in a way city officials believe is the best course of action for the well-being of the city, and why? Well, I would, I would push back on that and say that that's a false choice, because I think they're often the same thing. I think they're often, um, and, and it should be the same thing. It should be the same thing when you have people who are coming to your elected officials and asking for something. It's your responsibility as the elected official to figure out um, how you can respond to that and put it in place to where it's the benefit for everybody, right? Sometimes that's not to say it's perfect and that there aren't trade-offs there. Um, but as long as you're not being reactive as a politician, you're being proactive, you're seeking those things out, you're measuring your, your information and you're collecting the right data, you have the right people at the table to help you make those decisions. Ideally, that'll be the best for the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have a hypothetical question. So if you were to receive a $1 million grant to use for the city in any way you wanted, what would you do with the money and why? Wow, a million dollar grant to receive to this city. Hmm. That's a good question. Let's see. What, so what are priorities that we have? One is to, um, I think, have more of, a, um, more of a connection with our universities to the city. So what I would love to do is have put some programs in place that connect UCR and Cal Baptist and La Sierra with more of job training within the city and um, getting our, our uh, businesses to support, um, to support the students coming out of there and having the resources that they need to get the students to work for them. So something like that I think is really important. But then of course I'm an environmentalist. So I would love to make sure all of our parks are beautiful, open, maintained, well cared for, um, and that we are uh, serving our people in those parks because I think that's an important underpinning of our community is um, where people can come together, not just across the miles, but across generations to be there and, and enjoy the outdoors with each other. So, of course, that, that's my pipe dream, but I, I'm sure I'd have to do something more practical with the money. So. <laughs> Do you have any favorite Notre Dame traditions? Oh my gosh. Favorite Notre Dame traditions, let's see. Um, going to football games. I think that was a big deal when I was growing up. That was, the, that was something we look forward to in the fall every year. And, um, you know, away or home games, uh, we just would have so much fun. And it's really fun for me now to see my friends who are out there, their kids going to Notre Dame, or you know, um, just knowing that there's, they have relatives out there. There's because there were so many big families at Notre Dame. Our family of five was one of the smaller ones, I will say. Um, uh, you know, like Mayor Bailey, right? His wife went here too, and so her sister was my best friend um, growing up. I mean, she was voted, I think, class clown, and I was voted most popular our senior years. So. Um, you know, you see people out in the community, and I still hear them. Like, I have a, a friend who was um, at Notre Dame football game, and my friend is also the athletic director at North, who was uh, in my class here, and he was a football player here, and 
it's just it's very cool to see that that tradition continues out in the community. So I love it. We had a lot of fun at those football games. Do you guys like those? Yes. <laughs> no, they're just fun. <laughs> Well, let's just say I wasn't always the most respectful kid back then. I was a teenager, youngest of five. Pretty selfish, I will say, probably. But um, I would say to really value, look around you and value what you have here. The family you have, the community you have in Notre Dame, the uh, lessons that you're taught here that will make you a successful human being. Um, to not only value those, but but enjoy them while you have them because you have no idea how much they will benefit you as you grow older. Thank you. Is that the last question? Are we done? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, you guys. I appreciate it. It has been really fun to come back.